Have you ever tried one of those DNA testing kits? This is where you send in some saliva in their sealed tube, and they analyze it, and they tell you from your DNA where your ancestors came from. And they'll also give you some names of people who share some of your DNA, and those people are your relatives. And many of them are people you've probably never met. I recently did this with one of the DNA kit companies called 23andMe. I got the results back, and they gave me a list of 1,500 people who were all somewhere in my family tree. And I've even gotten in touch with some of them. Check this out. When I was a kid, we lived in Ohio, but we had a lot of family in Virginia because that's where my dad was from. I had a great uncle who lived in Virginia, and he was in the market for a dog. Well, it turns out our dog had just had a litter of puppies, and we had a dog available. This puppy was a mixed breed, but was mostly black lab, and he was all black except for a little bit of white right on the tip of his tail. So we named him Tippy. I'm a real animal lover, and I loved Tippy. This was when I was probably about 9 or 10 years old. We drove to Virginia and brought him with us because, of course, he was going to go live with my uncle. I remember the day we were leaving, specifically, and the last time I saw Tippy. I was really sad about that. Okay, now fast forward to a few weeks ago when I got the results back from the DNA test. I got in touch with a young lady who was actually the granddaughter of my uncle in Virginia. I mentioned to her the story about Tippy, mainly because it's one of the stories that stands out from my childhood. Later that day, she emailed me a picture of my uncle, and there was Tippy in that picture. She said she remembered my uncle, her grandfather, having that dog and what great companions they were. So I thought that was pretty cool. But that's nothing compared to the story you're about to hear from today's guest, Monica. She's 40 years old, lives in the Midwest, and she has gone through her whole life, in a lot of ways, just like lots of other people. She grew up in a typical family environment with her mom and dad, so of course she knew who her family was. They celebrated Father's Day every year, just like many people will this coming Sunday. But then she discovered that what she thought was true for 40 years wasn't actually the truth at all. Real people in unreal situations. There is a man standing in front of me in my bedroom. My friend has been shot. I'm in the literally inside the river, and I'm inside my car. He had told me multiple times that he was going to set himself on fire. If you say my name or try to look at me, I'm going to kill you. And he was just sobbing. He said, Mom, Mom, tell me you're going to be okay. And I jumped on the hood of the car, and I held on. And I looked into the garage, and he was hanging from the rafters. I had somebody standing on my neck. He's better to me dead. I want him dead. I'm Scott Johnson, and this is What Was That Like? When you were growing up, did your parents ever talk about family or genealogy or anything? Only from the standpoint that I knew my dad's parents were Armenian and Italian, one of each. And that my mom, she is Southern from Alabama. And they, of course, always swore that they were Native American um, of some flavor and uh, just a mix of different, different things. Never really truly nailed down what exactly, but just kind of like a Heinz 57. So I knew I had quite a few little things in me, but I knew my dad's parents were Armenian Italian. I knew my mom was Southern and we were probably Indian. <laughs> and that's about it. And really, you had no reason to question any of that. No, no. My parents, I mean, they were they were married for a long time. And I was always at family functions. And people would say that, you know, I resembled my dad's mother. I resembled my grandmother. Or I looked just like my Aunt Amy. I would resemble my mother. Those kinds of things. So I would never, never imagine to question it. I understand sometimes people would think that you were Irish. <laughs> yes. So even though I kind of resembled my grandmother and I kind of resembled my aunt, I was definitely the oddball, the fairest skin 
imaginable. I'm covered with freckles. I have big, bright green eyes and reddish brown hair, and it's super curly. And nobody in my immediate family was like that at all. My mother had darker skin, jet black hair, dark, dark brown eyes. And my dad had very light brown hair, like almost like a sandy, sandy dishwater blonde, you know, big blue eyes. And there was me, my, even my brother didn't, we didn't look alike. My brother was dark complected and dark, dark brown hair, dark, dark brown eyes, real tall and slender. And, you know, I barely, you know, could reach the countertops. I still can't really reach the countertops, to be honest with you. (laughs) So you figured somewhere back in the family line, there was somebody that was fair skinned. Absolutely. Absolutely. There, There had to be somebody that kind of resembled me. So you were you just grew up with your mom and dad, mm-hmm. and then before we get into the story of really of what happened and what we're going to talk about, what happened when you were twenty two years old? My mother, she for a long, long time, she owned a restaurant, and um, she just gotten tired of it. She just wanted to be out of the restaurant industry, but she was a workaholic. She loved to work, so she just wanted to get a job to where she would go to work, work, and then come home. And she found this little factory job over across the border in Illinois. And she worked for a company that they made fire safety equipment. And that really intrigued her. So she enjoyed that. But it was the late night shift. So she'd get home pretty late at night, right around like one-ish in the morning. And on December 19th of 2003, right before Christmas, she was heading home. And she knew it was before Christmas. So She wanted to stop and cash her payroll check so she could get up bright and early and finish her last bit of Christmas shopping. So she stopped at a check cashing stop right kind of near her house, cashed her check, put her money away and started heading home. But unbeknownst to her, there was a car sitting there um, watching and uh, they saw my mom and she wasn't a very big lady. She was only five, one, five, two, and maybe a hundred pounds, 120 pounds soaking wet. And, uh, they followed her all the way home to her driveway where they got out of their car and approached her and demanded her purse. But what they didn't realize is that my mother is Southern and you don't take anything that doesn't belong to you, no matter what it is. And my mother even though she was only five foot one, she was incredibly feisty and she wasn't going to have any of it. So she fought back. And um, these two men that attacked her were, you know, big boys. They were, they were very big and they subdued her. She struggled, got a little loud. So they took it upon themselves to take her life and they shot her. And, um, she died in her driveway right before Christmas that year. And that was the absolute hardest day of my life. Waking up the next morning to the sheriff's department, knocking on my door, telling me they had something really important to tell me and then I needed to sit down. And, um, you know, I'm in, I'm in the medical profession. I read the autopsy report. I know that medically she had a quick death. She was shot in the neck and it severed her carotid artery and punctured her spinal cord. So death was pretty swift, but it just still hurts that to think that she was still there by herself in the snow until somebody got there. I just... I hate thinking about it, but sometimes I can't help but think about it. It just, to me, it just strikes me as just being so senseless. It really was so senseless in the, (laughs) to the point to where these two men were caught several months later. And, uh, it was just, it was a mess. The whole, the whole court case was a mess. There wasn't a whole lot of evidence to go off with my mother's case and, um, unfortunately, but semi-fortunately, they committed another crime right afterwards and they robbed a gas station and 
took the gas station attendant's life as well. And because of that, they were able to link both of the cases together. They were able to compile a lot more evidence for my mother's case and a stronger case against the um, the gas station murder as well. So they're both serving two consecutive sentences back to back. They're away for a long time, which is nice. I, I mean, I, I guess... I guess that's as good as justice as, you know, our families are going to get, but they're, they're serving their time. (laughs) They stole my mom's purse. And what they failed to realize is that she never, (laughs) she never kept money in her purse (laughs) because when my brother and I were little younger, we would, you know, ask her for lunch money for school and be like, Hey ma, can we have like $5? We have $10 for lunch this week. And She's like, yeah, sure. It's in my purse. And of course, we're not going to just take five or ten dollars. We're going to take the 20 that's there instead. And then we're going to buy junk all week long and live on the high horse eating Pop-Tarts at school. So she stopped putting money in her purse forever. She never put money in her purse. So after she cashed that check at the check cashing station, she stuck the five hundred dollars. She stuck five hundred dollars in her pants pocket. So the criminals got like a really crummy, like Walmart purse. They didn't even get her money. There was like nothing in her purse besides like a hairbrush and some old gum. (laughs) There was no money. They went to jail for most of their lives for stealing like a $10 purse, basically. So to me, I think that feels more like justice than anything else. Like jokes on you, goofballs. Have you ever contacted either one of them? I've wanted to a lot, but I didn't think that it would serve any good purpose for me, for my soul. But my daughter, my daughter did. My daughter's 22 and she was four at the time of my mother's death. And they were very close. They were two peas in a pod. My mother and her were, there was nobody closer. She was the best grandmother in the whole world. And um, she just recently reached out to both of them against my will, (laughs) I might add. She was immediately blocked by the accomplice. Um, He didn't even give her the time of day. So, and this was contacting by email, right? Email. Yeah. There's like, um, there's like a prison email or something that they can do almost like, like a Facebook sort of thing, but not quite. Right. Right. It's interesting. And she used that. And so that's how she knows that the accomplice had blocked her. So she wasn't able to send any more messages, but the shooter, he did answer her. And I cringed when she told me, because I couldn't imagine that he would say anything worthwhile. But um, to my surprise, he was incredibly thoughtful with his words and um, very apologetic, but understanding of the fact that To us, his apology would mean nothing because of the life that he took. But he was very kind in his words, very apologetic. He's been in prison now for 17 years. It's a really long time. He was just a kid himself when he went in. He was only, I think, 18 or 19 when he went into prison. So he's been in in prison for almost as long as he walked the earth prior. And he's still got a long time to go. He does. He, for just my mother's sentence, he has 60 years to serve and then he'll serve another 60 for the gas station attendant as well. So being for a very long time. Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Well, the reason I wanted to get that story out there is because it's going to become relevant later on in what you're talking about. So this whole thing This is one of the funny things about this story is that it was triggered by such a random, it was, it was a gift to you. Yes. yes, How how did this, how how did this start? (laughs) So my boyfriend, he is American Indian, Mexican American Indian, excuse me. And he was showing me on his ancestry app that he has all about where the indigenous people from his heritage came from and 
the years in which they migrated and how they moved from the Yucatan area and moved up through Mexico and then started dispersing through the United States. And I was just so fascinated by it. I was just like, this is so amazing that they can do this. This technology is crazy. It's so cool. And he's like, well, your family's from Italy and Armenia. Like they had to have at some point in time migrated to this area. And I was like, well, yes, of course. Um, He's like, if you did this, it would show your family's migration and it would show like where they came from before that and, you know, where they, where they were settled and wow, that's, that's really neat. And his, (laughs) his sweet self, he was like, well, do you want one? Yeah, of course. So right then and there, he just went in there, purchased a DNA kit for me. And a couple days later, it was a, my doorstep and, uh, it was so sweet and so thoughtful. And I was so excited. I was so excited to see like where exactly my family lived. I knew what they were, but where they lived. And then also, and more importantly too, I wanted to prove my mother wrong from beyond the grave. I wanted to, you know, show her that there's, there's no way that we're native American. There's just no possible way. Um, so that was my like, ha ha to her. Um, Cause that definitely came back as a big no. <laughs> well, this, the kit that you got this time was, it was, I know there's a few different companies that make these kits and this one was called ancestry DNA. Yes. Ancestry DNA was the first one that I did. What, what's involved with having this research done? What do you have to send them? They send you a kit and it's very clear instructions. You know, you don't eat or drink or brush your teeth prior to performing the test. And there's a little vial that you have to fill with saliva. And in retrospect, it's not a lot of saliva. I think it's only like a quarter of a teaspoon. But when you're sitting there trying to fill that thing up, you're like, gosh, dang, how much more spit does this thing need? You're sitting there like spitting forever. And um, your mouth is like so dry because you just want to drink of water. (laughs) You're just filling this thing up for all of eternity. But it was pretty simple. Like once it got to the line, you close up the lid and then it mixes the stabilizing solution. And with it, you shake that up and put it back in the little bag and send it right back off to the lab. And uh, within a few days, the lab gets it. And the app is really cool. It's very user-friendly. They'll show you the progress of everything along the way. They'll let you know when they get the kit and when it started to process in their lab. And now what they're doing with it, they're genotyping it and they're reviewing your DNA and your results are ready. And it's, I want to say it was probably like around three weeks or so from start to finish. But I swear to you, it felt like the longest three weeks of my life while I was waiting for all of this. It was, it felt like forever. (laughs) For some people that are that are doing it for a specific reason, because they want to find out something about their family, that I love the idea that they have this app where they they keep you updated on the progress. Because otherwise, they'd be getting phone calls every day. Is it done yet? Is it ready <laughs> right. yet? Where's my stuff? Is <laughs> right. it ready? Where's my stuff? Have you have you looked at it? Is it yeah. just sitting there? But one thing I I forgot to mention to you during our previous talks, I had the opportunity to do this test just two years prior to doing it for real. My oldest daughter, she had bought me a DNA kit. She wanted to find a little bit more about her DNA, her heritage, her family, because again, she knew what I was. So that wasn't a mystery, but her dad was a little unsure of his genealogy. So she wanted just some clarification. So one mother's day, she went ahead and bought us both kits and it was like so fun and exciting. And we filled them up together and cleared them up and sent them off. And her results came back relatively quickly and mine were still pending. And we're like, what in the world? Well, we'll just give it a couple of days. Cause just cause we mailed it off together. doesn't mean they got processed together. So we gave it about an extra week and there was still nothing. Mine says it's still sitting at the laboratory. So she ended up reaching out to the customer service for ancestry DNA. And they're like, Oh gosh. Um, so yeah, about that test, uh, it got lost in the lab. <laughs> We're like, it got lost in the lab. How in the world does that happen? And they're like, well, we can send you another one or we can refund your money. And a couple of years ago, she, you know, she was much younger and I was like, just take the money back. It's totally fine. Like just take your money. It's not a big deal. It's fine. So that was the end of it. And even when her results came back in, I was 
like, hmm, that's interesting. It shows that you're Eastern European, but it doesn't specifically say Armenia or Italy, which I thought it would because ancestry DNA is really, really big. And they test very specifically through different areas, countries. There's hundreds of thousands that they test for. And it didn't pop up, but I was like, ah, I mean, that would probably make sense. There's probably not a whole lot in you because there's maybe only half in me. So there's less than a quarter in you. So maybe that's why it's just broadly grouped as Eastern European. That's probably why didn't think anything else of it, like nothing. It was just like, oh, that's interesting. Moved on, moved forward. And so when my results came back, that's when it was like, oh, hmm, okay, interesting. What did that first test of yours show? Much to my surprise, it showed that I was Northwestern European. It's like, okay, that makes sense. That's like, Britain area, English. That makes sense. And then it showed I was Eastern European slash Russian. I was like, no, oh, Russia. Well, that doesn't make sense. So it's probably Eastern European. I don't know. That's weird. And then it showed I was very heavily Irish and that's it. It's like, okay, so uh, <laughs> where's the Italian and Armenian? Like, that's kind of weird. So I started looking it up making sure like they're actually testing for these regions. And sure enough, there's those very specific regions, like especially for Italy, they test between Northern and Southern Italy. And I wasn't on either of those spectrums. So then I started thinking, well, all right, well, maybe my dad isn't really, you know, 50, 50. That's happened before people have thought they were, German. And it turns out they're not German. They're actually Austrian. So maybe it was just, you know, his family lived in Italy, but maybe they weren't Italian. Maybe they migrated there. So I just found that kind of odd, but um, I'm very, very close with my father's sister, uh, my aunt Amy. She was a huge part of my life, still is. Um, She really helped raise me. My parents both worked all the time. So I spent a lot of time with my aunt Amy So I called her because I knew she had taken one of these DNA tests, but I couldn't remember which one. And she said that she hadn't taken the ancestry DNA. She had taken another one and we were talking about it. And she's like, well, that's kind of odd that it didn't show (laughs) Italy or Armenia. That should very much be on there. She's like, I am for sure Italian and Armenian. She's like on mine, I did 23 and me. And mine broke it down very specifically. I'm almost 50-50 of each. There's very little of anything else. So maybe you should take that one. And that way it'll be more definitive because we're both related. It'll link our DNA together. So it'll show what we have in common and where it overlaps and whatnot, because that's my, that's my dad's sister. That's my, my blood aunt. Right. With a known family member. Yeah. That would. Yeah. So I was like, Oh, okay. Yeah. My dad probably would not want to do a DNA test. That's, that's not his, that's not his thing. So to ask him to do it, he'd probably be like, uh, I don't want to, I don't, I don't think so. I don't, I don't want to do that. No, that, no, that's okay. I'll pass. But my aunt already did one. So perfect. All right. Well, now I gotta now I gotta go buy a a twenty three and Me kit. Okay. <laughs> so I really wanted to know though, like what's going on. And the other thing that was very weird was on ancestry DNA, it'll show you your DNA relatives, like all the people that have taken this particular test on either side of your family. And I recognize a lot of the people on my mom's side of the family. My mom has a, a lot of a lot of ancestors there, and some of the names really stuck out. I'm like, oh, for sure, for sure, for sure. And then I kind of, by logical deduction, I guess, kind of excluded certain names because of the Eastern European. I assumed that that would be my father's side. And I started looking at those names and none of those names looked familiar at all. None of them. And then, I mean, even with my mother's side of the family, there wasn't anybody closer related to me than like a third cousin. So it was very difficult to even like contact these people and be like, oh, hey, who's your grandma and grandpa? Because it's third cousins. Like, 
not too many people know their third cousins. So I thought, okay, ancestry is kind of a wash. This is going to give me the information I need, but now I feel committed. So I'm going to go ahead and buy the 23andMe so I can get some pretty clear answers. It seems like maybe it's more user-friendly. I'll do that one. And so sure enough, I ordered my kit and a couple of days later in the mail comes another kit. <laughs> and it's the same thing. You, you fill up the vial with, with saliva. Same thing. You know, you seal that back up, mail it off. And again, the app, very user-friendly. It was really great. They have a tracking system on there. So you can see every step of the way, what's going on with your DNA and the progress it's making and where, it, what step it's at and their review. And that one, so I thought the first one took forever. The second one, I was checking that every day, like a psycho, I'm like maybe it's got to be done. It says it's not supposed to be done for three more weeks, but I'm going to still check it anyway. Cause maybe they finished it early <laughs> And every day. It was like, Oh my gosh, is it ever going to be done? Is it ever going to be done? Oh my goodness. I was so like excited and nervous to see what the results were. And I got the results. I was at work and I was just about finished up and I got a little ding on my email that said, you know, your 23 and me results are ready. And, oh, how cool. I can't wait to get home so I can open this up and check it out. Rushed straight home, opened it up. And so weird because it was almost the exact same as ancestry DNA as far as the percentages. Still not Italian, still not Armenian, and definitely Russian. Uh, more specifically, uh, it was Czechoslovakia. Like, huh. All right. And then the sinking stomach feeling when I saw that, you know, I knew my aunt's email address, so I had added her prior to my results coming in. And when I clicked on her name, it said something to the effect of, you know, it's always nice to share your family history with friends to show where, you know, overlapping family could be from, something to that effect. And then at the very bottom, it said, our results have determined you and Amy are not related within the last four generations. And I just was kind of beside myself. Truly that moment, my world just went crashing down. What is, what do you mean? That's, we're not related. That's my aunt. Surely we're related. What, what is, what is going on? Yeah. You almost have to assume that the test made a mistake. I, that's what I thought. I'm like this. This can't be, this can't be correct, but how in the world can two separate DNA tests produce almost identical results? How, how in the world this, this can't be right. This can't be right. And, um, I remember the phone call I made to my aunt and she's like, honey, I know I already saw and I was like, what, what does this mean? Do you sometimes feel depressed? Are you anxious about something in your life? Are you sometimes stressed out about work or a particular family relationship? Or have you been through something pretty traumatic and you're having trouble figuring out how to deal with that? Well, I'm here to tell you, you're not alone. A lot of the people I've had on this podcast as guests have found great benefit in talking to someone. And that's why I'm happy to recommend BetterHelp. As soon as you contact BetterHelp, the first thing they'll do is assess your needs and figure out your situation, and then they match you with your own licensed professional therapist. And this doesn't take long at all. You're communicating within 48 hours. You can message your counselor anytime, day or night, and you have access to them every week, either by phone or video. If that counselor doesn't work out, you're free to change, and it costs nothing to do that. And please understand, this is not some kind of crisis line this is professional counseling done online and securely, and it's available worldwide. If you're concerned about the cost, you're going to be happy to know that BetterHelp is actually less expensive than traditional offline counseling. And even with that, financial aid is available if you need it. And you never have to worry about parking because you just park your butt right on the couch at home. 
And because you're one of my listeners, you can get started and save some money. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and you can get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash what was. If you're ready to start living a happier life, this is your opportunity. Visit betterhelp.com slash what was and get your first month at 10% off. And thanks to BetterHelp for sponsoring this podcast. And I was going through every possible scenario like, okay, maybe my dad has my aunt and my dad have the same mother, but maybe their father is different. Well, no, that won't make sense genetically because then that would still mean that that would be my half aunt, if you will. So we would share at least a portion of her DNA. So that's not possible. So maybe my dad was adopted. Nope, that's not possible either. My dad is the oldest of six siblings and they are carbon copies of each other. (laughs) All six kids, they all look alike. Um, You could tell that they're related. There's, there's no guess. So nope, that that's for sure. My aunt's brother, that is for sure. Not my father. What in the world? (laughs) What in the world? Did you ask him about it directly? I didn't know how I, I felt, I felt sad for him because I'm getting ready to turn 40 years old. I turn 40 years old next month. So for almost 40 years of my life, this man has raised me as his own. I was kind of a daddy's girl. He took me everywhere. I mean, we went everywhere together. Gosh, my dad had a motorcycle and I was always on the back of that thing. There there was a big layoff at the mills up here back in the early 80s. And I remember being at the picket line with my dad because I wanted to hang out with him. So I'm sitting at the picket line saying like, USS sucks with my little sign eating hot dogs, you know, just because I wanted to be by my dad. So to break that news to him, I, I didn't even know how to. Did he know? Did he not know? I had no clue. So I was like, okay, I've got to put my super sleuth hat on and do some major investigation before I present him with this information. There's just no way I can just bomb him with this and be like, hey, who's my real dad? And obviously, as we mentioned earlier, you can't go to your mom for any answers. No, and I'm sure that woman is just rolling over in her grave, just having a good old laugh about this. She has to, like, I can't ask her. I can't go to her and be like, Mom, what were you doing in 1980? Who was my real father? Who's my biological father? She can tell me. So what do you do? How do you figure this out? Oh, my gosh, Scott. So... If I ever decide to leave my job, I think I'm going to go send in an application to the CIA because I dug up so much information with basically nothing. So the ancestry DNA didn't prove anything to be any kind of relevance. There was nobody that could be closely related to me to where I could reach out to them and get something from them. I found on 23andMe that I had a First cousin twice removed, which I found out is means second cousin. So that was the only close connection that I had. And it was on my father's side. So I, of course, reached out on the app. There's this really cool messaging portion of it to where you can talk to family members. And so I sent her a message. Her name was or is Amber Hansen. And She didn't have anything in her profile. There wasn't an age. There wasn't a location. It just said, Amber Hansen, female, done. So when I messaged her, I didn't hear anything back, but I figured it'd probably take a little bit while. Maybe she's not going to see it right away. And gosh, several, several weeks, probably the better part of a month went by before I tried to contact her again because I was just kind of getting desperate. But in the meantime, I'm doing all my research to try to piece things together. And my mother was actually a very private person. She had a lot of friends. She knew a lot of people. She was very well liked by everybody. My my mom didn't ruffle anybody's feathers. I started contacting anybody that I knew from back then. Old employees that I still knew how to get a hold of because the marvels of Facebook. 
I got a hold of my mom's cousin. I got a hold of my mom's cousin's friend and my mom's old boss. I just started calling these people and I'm like, Hey, it's Monica. Do you remember me? And everybody's like, of course I remember you. And it's like, okay, so I got to ask you, you know, how well did you know my mom back in like 1979 and 1980? You know, do you know anybody that she might've been dating around that time? And the answer was always no, 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 your mom kept that kind of private. She really didn't talk about who she was seeing or anything like that. My mom's best friend, whom I also call aunt, I just kind of grew up with her as being my aunt, but she wasn't. I even called her one night out of desperation and she answered the phone and I was like, who in the hell is my father? And she was like, "Um, come again. Who is my father? And she's like, "Um, well, I thought it was your dad, Tom. And I was like, nope, it is not. It is not. So who was mom seeing back then? And even she was like, honey, I, I don't know. I don't know who she was seeing back then. I, I, you know, I had had a baby too. And, you know, even though we were still talking and we we're still great friends, we were just kind of living separate lives a little bit because I was taking care of my baby and, you know, she was getting married and having a baby herself. So we just didn't see a whole lot of each other. Again, I, I felt lost. I, I had no idea where I was going to go with this and where this was going to turn. And if I would ever find out, I kind of prepared myself for everything. I prepared myself for just never finding out. You're just never going to know Monica. This isn't, this isn't meant to be. Um, I prepared myself for, okay, you're going to find out who your father is, but he's not going to want anything to do with you. He knew about you then he didn't want you then he doesn't want you now or the sad possibility that, you know, maybe my father had passed away. I just, I didn't know, but I didn't want to be crushed. I didn't want to be crushed again. This was a big enough blow to find this out and to be crushed all over again was just, it was something hard to swallow. I had to really make a decision. Do I really want to pursue this or do I just want to live my life never knowing? And I felt like I owed it to myself to find out, you know, again, there was never any question when I grew up that my mom was my mom and my dad was my dad. But there were just little bitty things that always made me wonder because I didn't truly look like my dad and I didn't truly look like my mom, but like, who did I look like? And, you know, everybody always assumed I was Irish. They would take one look at me and be like, oh, I bet you're Irish. And I'd be like, no. (laughs) And little things like I was, I was such a little nerd. I was such a nerd. I love to read. I would be in the library all the time. I would read two books at once. And when I was done reading those books, I'd read two more. And I just, I love to, I love to draw and I love to sing. I I love to sing so much. I love all music. I love every kind of music there is. And I'm always singing. I'm always humming, always whistling. And neither one of my parents were really like that. And I just thought it was kind of odd and uh, just wanted things to make sense. So did. I just jumped in with both feet. And I'm like, I'm going to figure this out. And I made it my mission. My family, my, my kids here were, <laughs> they were slightly neglected for a couple of weeks. I would come home from work and I would just bury myself in research. Like I'm going to look for this. I'm going to look for that. I'm going to call this person. I'm going to meet with that person. And um, even my boyfriend had looked at me and he's like, Monica, you gotta, you gotta stop you gotta, you gotta slow down, like pump the brakes. This is, you're getting a little crazy. And it just fueled my fire even more, but to my detriment, it was eating me alive. And every moment I could, I was trying to research things and I knew it wasn't healthy. I knew I knew I needed to calm down and stop, but I just couldn't, there was like this fire raging inside of me. And it was consuming me. And I remember one day it was in uh, January of this year, I had gone to church on a Sunday morning and I was like, listen up, God, (laughs) you have got to take this from me. Like just take it away from me. 
I don't need this anymore. I'm, I'm cool not knowing. I am totally fine not knowing. You've got to take this from me so I can stop obsessing about it. Or you have to literally lead me by the hand to show me how to figure this out. Like one of these two options, there can't be any gray area. One of these two paths, put me on it because I can't do this anymore. I just, I can't. It was the very next day when I had a breakthrough. I woke up more consumed than ever. And I was like, ah, gosh, dang it. Like I could have sworn I remember asking for this to just go away. And I was crying on the way to work. I was just so consumed with everything and so upset. And I just knew that I would never, I would never find out, never going to find out. There's not enough information. And I just kept coming back to that name, Amber Hansen. So I decided to look her up on Facebook, hoping that that was the right name. I didn't know if that was her maiden name or her married name. I had no clue. And again, I had no information. I didn't know if she was 13 or 75. Looked her up on Facebook and holy smokes, there's a lot of Amber Hansons on Facebook. (laughs) There's a lot. (laughs) I had no idea where to start. So I decided, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take a screenshot of my 23andMe profile showing that her and I are connected. I'm going to, at random, friend request a person named Amber Hansen. And I'm going to send them a private message showing them this profile and which is the simple question like, hey, this is my 23andMe profile and it shows that I'm related to an Amber Hansen. Is this you? And wait for a response. And then when I've got my response that it's a no, then I'll move on to the next one and I'll just cross them off my list. So I looked at all the names and I was just overwhelmed with how many there were. And I just started looking at the pictures. and I'm like, all right, I'm going to pick the one that looks nice. (laughs) That way I can be let down nicely. (laughs) And I came across one and she just looked so sweet. It was a picture of her and her husband. And I friended her and I sent her the message as I had stated. And she messaged right back, like within a few minutes. It's like, holy smokes, that was was quick. That's a quick no. (laughs) And much to my surprise, her answer was, I don't know. I have 23 of me. Let me check. So she got right back to me and she's like, yeah, that is, that's me. Um, yeah, we're related. Like, holy cow. The first Amber Hansen I messaged on Facebook out of hundreds, hundreds is the one that I'm related to because I just thought her picture was pretty and I thought she looked really sweet and nice. <laughs> <laughs> Who says you can't choose your family, right? Right? There was something about her that my DNA knew. Like, I think I'm related to this person. I think I'm going to message her. And it went so fast from there. Like, my heart was racing. Like, I felt sweaty. And I was I was just so excited. I was jumping out of my skin. Like, oh, my gosh, this, this is her. This is the person I've been trying to message. And I even said something to her like, hey, I did message you on the app. She's like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I didn't see it. Like it goes to a different email. I don't ever check it. I just got it just to see what my heritage was. And once I found out, I just never looked at it again. There was no reason for me to. So just never, never did. So sorry. And I was like, okay, well, I have a huge favor to ask of you. You know, I I need help trying to figure out who my biological father is and you're my only connection. And if you would spare a few minutes to try to help me, I would greatly appreciate it. And Amber and I, the little super sleuths that we apparently are, uh, narrowed it down like so quick. It went like so fast after that. We talked about, okay, Hanson is not her maiden name. It's her married name. So her maiden name is this. And, um, I got my, my aunt Debbie, my mom's best friend. I got her on text and I was like, Hey, stay by your phone. I'm going to shoot you some questions to try to help narrow this down. She's like, okay. So she would say, you know, this is my maiden name and ask my aunt, like, does this name sound familiar? And she's like, no, that doesn't. And then she was like, well, okay, this is my, my grandmother's maiden name. So I text my aunt. I was like, okay, does the name McLean sound familiar to you? 
And she's like, yes, yes, it does. Okay. Yes. There was a Tom and a Dave McLean that lived right down the street from your mother and I. It's like, okay. So tell Amber like, yep. McLean is a go. It's a possibility. And she's like, well, that's my great uncle. Those are my great uncles. And um, my dad lives right down the street from my great uncle Tom. What? She's like, yeah, let me, let me call him real quick and see if he could, you know, go ask uncle Tom if he knows your mom. So I gave her some specifics. I told her my mother's full name I, back then, you know, it was Brenda Barksdale. You know, it would have been summer to fall of 1980 to where they were together. And she told her dad, he went right down the street and you know, marched right down there. He's like, Hey, uncle Tom, I got a weird question to ask you. Um, do you remember a woman named Brenda Barksdale? And right away he was like, yeah, of course. Why? (laughs) He's like, well, well, turns out uh, you might have a daughter. And I could only imagine his shell shock. Yeah. I could only imagine his shell shock. Like I picture those old cartoons, like when they're, when their jaw drops to the floor and they have to roll it back up. That's, that's what I picture my dad having done his just jaw just completely dropped to the floor. Like, what, what do you mean? Like you're telling me after 40 years, I have a daughter like what? And right away she came back and she's like, well, my dad just called me. And he said that, um, your dad definitely remembers your mom. And, um, I think it was a little bit more than fondly. (laughs) She's like, here's my dad's name. Here's his number. Give him a call tomorrow. Cause it was getting kind of late too. It was, this was all happening so late in the evening. She's like, give him a call tomorrow and he'll, he'll fill you in on some details and we'll see where we go from there. But Hey, welcome to the family. That started the big journey. How do you even sleep that? (laughs) I don't remember sleeping actually. (laughs) I was so wired like somebody shot straight caffeine into my veins and my boyfriend was just laughing he's like hold on again pump the brakes monica (laughs) he's like you don't know if for sure if this man is going to be your father he you know she said that she has other uncles like maybe it could be one of the other uncles and you know maybe this guy knew your mom but he might not be your dad so like don't get your hopes up don't get your hopes up yet. Like, let's just wait, let's wait and see. And, you know, I had ordered an extra DNA kit. Just, I actually ordered two extra DNA kits just in case. So, and, you know, in the instance that I found somebody that was potentially my father, I could have them do the DNA so we can have it confirmed because I wanted to be certain, not just guessing. So he's like, wait, let's get some more information, send him the kit, have him test and then, then get excited. But right now, honey, please don't get excited. Like, please don't. And I, of course I didn't listen. I'm getting excited. He's the sensible one in this relationship. I can tell. He is way more sensible than I am. I think with my heart, I leap with both feet first and I ask questions later. He's like, whoa, back up highly suspect. We need answers first. Let's get all these 7 million answered first and then we'll make a decision on if we want to pursue or not and me i'm like no let's go i can't wait to find out this is exciting this is amazing i can't wait to hear about him (laughs) and did you even know what his initial response was when he found this out well so the next day i called Doug, Amber's father, I called Doug and talked to him and we talked on the phone gosh for a couple hours we were talking and he's like you know, honey, it's, he's, he's in shock right now. You know, um, I don't think there's really a question in his mind that you're not his, but he's just shocked because, um, he doesn't have any other children. He never had any other kids. He didn't know about you. He didn't know you existed. And he was just the type of guy that, you know, stayed childless, not because he didn't like kids or anything, but he just didn't think kids were going to be in his future. So he's a little shell shocked right now. So we're going to give him a little time. And he's like, but don't you worry. I'm going to work on him. <laughs> I'm going to work on him and, he, and you'll talk to him soon. I promise. I promise it'll be okay. And 
I just kept reassuring Doug, like, Hey, it's okay. If, if this is too much for him, it's okay. I really just wanted to know. And once I know I'm okay, if he wants to just keep it at that, that's totally fine. If he doesn't want a relationship with me, you know, that that's okay too. But I just, I needed to know for myself. And he's like, no, we're not having any of that. You're definitely in the family. We're definitely going to find out. Tom is definitely going to come along. He just needs a minute to process everything. I kind of had a good laugh about it too, because the father that raised me, his name is Thomas. And now I find out that my biological father's name is also Thomas. So at least my mom did kind of keep some names straight. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. might have been a little confusing for her at the time, I would imagine. Right, right, right. So I thought that was pretty hilarious that um, that both of their names were Tom. It's like, oh gosh, like how am I going to keep this straight? Okay, and so talk to Doug on a Tuesday, and on Wednesday, I woke up to a message from Doug, and he's like, "You were the first thing on my mind this morning. I'm just, I'm so excited for my uncle. Like this is such a wonderful thing, and you know, don't worry, he's he's warming up to the idea." He really wants to talk to you. He said he would like to call you this Sunday. I was like, oh, gosh, okay, great. Yeah, yeah, Sunday works. You you let him know, you know, what time works for him. I'll call around his schedule or he can call me. I'll give him my number, like whatever works for him. I want I want him to be comfortable. And he's like, yeah, I'll, I'll let him know. We'll, we'll come up with the time and we'll, you'll talk to him Sunday. Oh, great. So this was earlier in the day, this is probably eight or nine o'clock in the morning. And around five o'clock, I'm just about finished up with work. And I get a text message from Doug that says, Hey, what are you doing? <laughs> like, um, almost finished up with work. What's up? And he's like, well, somebody's here right now. And, uh, they want to talk to you now. I seriously love technology. I have multiple computers, an iPad, a couple of TVs. Most of the reading I do is on my Kindle e-reader. And of course, that device that's so addictive, my smartphone. I love the convenience of these things, but there's one thing I don't love, and that's the negative effect they have on my eyes. More specifically, the blue light they continuously put out. I used to worry about that, but not anymore because of my Felix Grey glasses that continuously filter out the blue light that comes from all those screens. I actually tried other blue light filtering glasses in the past, but they didn't work all that well because they just have regular glass with a thin coating on the lens. When Felix Grey glasses are created, the filtering is made as part of the lens itself, which means these blue light glasses filter out 15 times more blue light. They have lots of different styles to choose from. Mine are called Carver but there's sure to be a style that's right for you. And they're so comfortable, half the time I forget I'm even wearing glasses. And the prices are great. From $95 for blue light lenses, that's what I've got since I only use readers, but if you need prescription lenses, those start at just $145. And you order worry-free because they all come with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So you literally have nothing to lose, except for those tired eyes. Think about it. Your eyes have served you well your whole life, so they deserve a break. Go to felixgrayglasses.com slash what for the best blue light glasses on the market right now. That's F-E-L-I-X-G-R-A-Y glasses.com slash what. It's always free shipping and free returns and exchanges, so there's no risk. felixgrayglasses.com slash what. And thanks to Felix Gray for sponsoring this podcast. Oh my God. No. Um, oh my God. I'm still at work. Let me clean up. I gotta, I gotta get out of here. I'll keep him there. Don't let him leave. Please don't let him leave. <laughs> and he's like, don't, don't worry. He's not going anywhere. He's, he's staying right here. We'll, we'll be waiting for your call. All right. All right. I'll call you as soon as I get out. And I don't think I've ever cleaned up faster at work in my whole life. I got out of there so fast and sat in my car, took a deep breath and dialed that phone number and heard his voice on the other end for the first time in my life. And 
it was amazing. I, this is like a total cliche, like something out of a movie, but I've heard his voice before. I felt like, I felt like I've heard him before. I felt like I knew him. As soon as he said hello, it was soothing and comforting and almost unbelievable in a way. Like, I'm making this up. I'm such a goofball. But it really did. It felt familiar. I spent the next, like, two and a half hours on the phone. And that was it's one of the happiest days of my life. I, hands down. Hands down, one of the happiest days of my life. Did you have a list of things you wanted to talk about? Or, I mean... I- did. I just, I, where do you even start? You know, I know I, I did. I, I had like this mental list prepared. Like I'm going to ask him like about where he grew up and I'm going to ask him about his folks and I'm going to ask him about this and that. And like all that went out the window, <laughs> my list was gone out of my head. And we just started talking about anything that popped into our heads, our likes and our dislikes and, you know, do you like hot sauce? Do you like hot stuff? <laughs> and both of us love hot sauce. <laughs> we love hot things. And to quote my dad, he's like, oh, I love hot sauce. Just like just like the commercial says, I, I put that shit on everything. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought that was just the best. That was so hilarious. There's always hot sauce in our, our refrigerator. And uh, there's probably more hot sauce condiments than anything else in our fridge at any given time. Had you already seen a picture of him? Did you, do you know if there was a resemblance or anything? The only picture I had seen of him was a, like a, a cell phone picture that Doug had taken. And my poor dad, he was just sitting kind of like in a lawn chair, like all like just hunched over and, you know, he had his quarantine hair grown out, his little quarantine beard and even after Doug sent the picture, my dad was like, oh, God, why did you send that picture? That's horrible. <laughs> so, you know, it was far away. It was taken on a, you know, a crummy little cell phone. So that was the only picture I had seen of him. So for that, I couldn't really, I couldn't really tell. But right away, my boyfriend, his name's Robert. Uh, right away, he's like, oh, my God. Gosh, you guys have the exact same eyes. Like your eyes are the exact same. They're so bright. They're so vibrant. It's like you absolutely, you absolutely favor him. And I was like, really? You think so? Then the next picture I got, he sent me this picture of him at his senior, um, senior yearbook photo. And that was really cool. That was, so my dad was about 17. You know, he had his, 1970s, slightly wavy, curly quaff <laughs> and the beautiful butterfly collar. And it looked exactly like my son. My son is 17 and the resemblance was ridiculous, like ridiculously uncanny down to like the little birthmark on the cheek. It was insane. They looked so identical. And you're going to send me those pictures and we're going to put them on the website. I am because you are just going to be blown away. And then another picture I had gotten, not of my father, but of my grandparents, my my father's parents. So my grandmother, Florence, and my grandfather, Raymond, um, they both passed on. My dad is actually the youngest of six children. So his parents have been gone for a while. But um, when I saw the pictures of my grandparents, it was really... It's really neat to to see those, but also at the same time, it was so wild to see a picture of my grandmother Florence because her and I look like carbon copies. Like I 100% believe that that will be me in another, you know, 30 years because down to the the facial features and the eye shape and the lips, everything, everything was the same. That was, that's me when I get older. It's so wild. So I absolutely favor my dad's side. All the, all these years of not feeling like I look like my dad or I look like my mom. It's because I look like my biological father and his side of the family. One of the things that you told me was 
part of the conversation, you guys were talking about your dogs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he had asked me if I was an animal lover. And I was like, yeah, I, I love animals. I, I don't love taking care of them right now because I've got a lot of kids to take care of. But I love animals. And um, that was one of the things that I had begged for when I was a kid as I wanted an animal so badly. And my mother was allergic to cats. And my dad didn't really care for dogs, but um, I ended up getting my way eventually. And I was obsessed with NASA. I loved NASA. I loved the Challenger. I loved Sputnik. Those were like my favorite things to read about when I was a little girl. I would sit down in my basement and build model spacecrafts. <laughs> you know, I, I loved NASA. And so naturally, when I got my dog, I had to name it Laika. Laika was the first dog in space. And I mean, who wouldn't name their dog Laika if you were obsessed with NASA? Of course. So, yeah. my, I mean, obviously. So my dad and I were talking and he was like, oh, yeah, I had a German Shepherd. I was like, oh, that's cool. He's like, what color was yours? I was like, oh, she was black. She had a little bit of tan on her, but she was mostly black. And he's like, oh, that's neat. Mine was white. And we were kind of laughing like, oh, like yin and yang. I had the black and you had the white. And he's like, mine had a really unusual name, though. And I was like, oh, pff, can't be any more unusual than mine. I was like, mine was super obscure. Most people couldn't even pronounce it when they saw it written down. And he's like, well, my dog's name was Laika. And I just stopped. And there was like a really long pause. And I was like, what? He's like, yeah, my dog's name was Laika. He's like, that was the first dog in space. I was like, yeah, I know. Um that was my dog's name. My dog's name was Laika. <laughs> what? What? Are you serious right now? Are you, your dog's name was Laika. Yeah. Yeah. We both had German Shepherds named Laika. That is so <laughs> incredible. How weird. And it's such an unusual name, you know. I, it's so unusual. I didn't know that like, that was the name of the first dog in space. We just started laughing. And from then on, it was just like everything that we were talking about, you know, we had so many similarities and believing, do you believe in this? Do you believe in that? What about this? What about that? Do you like to read? Oh my God. I love to read. Oh, do you read about this? Oh yes. I love reading about that. And it was just so fun. But then he turned sad. I had to tell him about my mom and uh, he had just before I had told him about her, he had said that he can picture my mother he remembers everything about her. He said uh, she would sit in the sunlight and her hair was so black that it looked blue. And I found that like just so endearing and almost romantic. Like, you know, he really cared for her. You could tell that he cared for her. And so I had to tell him, I had to break the news to him that um, hey, the reason why I had to search you out on my own was that uh, my mom's not around anymore. You know, she had passed away. You could hear his heartbreak over the phone. He was just so sad for me. You know, he asked about how it happened, and I told him all the nitty gritty details. And he was just so sad. And then, but at the same time, during the story, he had like a burst of happiness because when he and my mom were together. She had only ever talked about wanting to own a restaurant. That was her dream. She's going to own a restaurant one day. And he didn't want to hold her back from that. He wanted, he wanted to see her achieve that. So when I had mentioned that she was leaving her factory job, he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, she didn't, she never owned the restaurant. And I was like, oh no, she did. She had it for many, many years and she just got tired of working hard every day. So she just sold it and moved into a factory job and he's like wait she did she bought it and I was like oh yeah yeah she she bought Santini's and she owned Santini's for many years and he you, you could just hear him like he was like clapping he's like that's awesome that's so amazing like I knew she would do it I knew she would do it and I was like oh my gosh like what a cheerleader like <laughs> this man is this man's wonderful it, it was a it was a great day I Again, had another day where I was just left on a high and I was so excited. And I had, I had asked him, you know, like, would you, would you mind taking this DNA test if I sent it down to you? 
And um, he's like, well, of course I will. You know, if you want me to, of course I will. But just so you know, like, I don't have any doubts that you're my daughter. And I was like, oh, well, that's very sweet of you. But, you know, I, we, we should probably be sure. And he's like, no, no, no. I I know. I know you are. You know, every, everything makes sense time frame wise. And, you know, I was with your mother at that time. And, but he said that most of his life, most of his adult life, he had had visions. I don't know. Visions is the right word. Daydreams maybe is a better word of a little girl that he never had. And he, you know, he always thought like, oh, it would have been really cool to have a daughter. It would have been neat. Like, oh, it would have been really cool to have like a set of twins. And so he'd try to picture, he could picture the little girl and then he'd try to picture like a little boy, like, oh, it'd be cool to have a little boy and a little girl. And he'd try to picture the little boy and he could never envision the little boy. Like he'd try and try and try and he could never just make it appear, but he could always picture exactly what that little girl looked like from little itty bitty to growing up. And I had sent my cousin Doug a few pictures, uh, pictures of me, pictures of my mom, pictures of my kids, because now my dad wasn't just the proud owner of a bouncing baby girl. He had uh, five grandchildren. (laughs) So I, you know, I wanted him to be able to see those pictures. So I sent them to Doug. So my dad knew what I looked like. And he said, um, as soon as I saw your picture, I knew you were my daughter because I've, I've had daydreams about you my whole life. Like you're the little girl in my daydreams. I was like, what? He's like, yeah, I've always pictured that I had a daughter and she looks just like you. She has that reddish brown curly hair and those big, bright green eyes and that fair skin and it's you. That's, that's you that I pictured. And I was just blown away. Did he know at the time that your mom was pregnant? Not truly. She was like 22, I think. And so she was dating both my dad that raised me and my biological father. And she had told them both separately that, hey, I I might be pregnant. And um, when she had told my biological father, they had they had broken up because Um, My biological father, Tom, he was working as a contractor at the mill and there were huge layoffs going on around them, like tons of layoffs. And so he had lost his job. So he lost his income. He had no more money. He lost his apartment. He had to go move back in with his mother. He just felt like an absolute loser. And he knew my mom had all these big dreams of owning a restaurant and being an entrepreneur and he didn't want to hold her back. So he's like, Brenda, you go, you go be with this other guy. You know, he's got a good job. He's very stable. You go be with him. He'll take good care of you. You know, you take care of you. And that's when she was like, Ooh, yikes. You know, I, I might be pregnant. And he's like, well, gosh, like, let me know. We'll we'll figure it out. Let me know. And he said that was the last he heard from her. He never heard from her after that. But then talking to my other dad, I found out that she told him, you know, the same thing, like, Hey, I might be pregnant. And his first response was, well, we got to get married. Let's go get married. And that's what they did. They quickly went and got married and the rest was history. So my mom didn't have any reason to reach back out to this, to this other guy because, you know, my other dad took care of things. One of the things that you wrote to me as we were communicating prior to this is, You said, for the first time in my life, I feel like I'm a part of something. What do you mean by that? I felt whole. I felt whole. Again, there was, there was nothing about my childhood that was, that was really wrong. I mean, I I was very lucky. I, I wasn't abused. I, my folks loved me. My extended family loved me. There, there could have been a little bit more like hands on love. My, neither one of my folks were like that. They were, they grew up to where they just, did it show that kind of affection? You know, they're not going to sit there and cuddle with you on the couch and watch a movie or, you know, call you sweetheart or dumpling. Like my, my dad's terms of endearment were like slobber box and butthead, you know, (laughs) like those were, those were his little terms of endearment, but you know, they were never ever meant to be mean. It was just, that was, that was his nicknames. So they weren't lovey dovey in any way, shape or form. We weren't the type of family to say like, all right, good night. I love you. And 
all right, we're, it was great seeing you today. Let me give you a hug and a kiss goodbye. Like it was never like that. And I really am the opposite of that. Like me personally, I need a lot of affection. I'm, I'm like a cat and I need affection and I like it a lot. I, I love to say, I love you. I feel like it's a missed opportunity if you don't say I love you. And I love to hold hands and I love to cuddle and snuggle and I'm, I'm very affectionate. And so not, not getting that as a child, I craved it. I really did. So my parents provided for me. I had everything I needed, but I just always kind of felt like there was something just a little bit amiss, something maybe a little bit off. And I, I couldn't, I couldn't tell you what that was. Like if you had asked me, you know, a year prior to that, I would have been like, I don't know. I have no idea. I don't know. I felt that completion when I found out that I had a biological father and I had a different family and people that were blood related to me. Not that, you know, that old saying blood is thicker than water. It didn't have anything to do with that. It was more just that biological connection to somebody that you can't shake no matter, no matter what good or bad, you you can't shake it. And I did, I felt like this huge puzzle was finally put together and all the pieces were faced, you know, facing the right direction. You can see everything clearly. And it felt so wonderful. It was great. You're in Indiana. Biological dad is in Florida. Florida. So you made a trip. I did. What was that like to meet him for the first time? Oh my gosh. So I tried to keep it in. And then I was just one day, I was like, I got to tell him that I'm coming down. I, I booked a ticket like a month ago. He was just so excited to know that I was coming down. And um, I was so nervous. I was so nervous. We went down there and I wanted to like mentally prepare myself. <laughs> so I didn't meet him that first day that we got there because we got there in the evening. So I was like, okay, I need like a night to sleep and prepare and like collect myself. And my boyfriend, we had gotten out of the car and he met us at the condo that we were staying at. And I didn't know Robert was recording and I get out of the car and I'm like, all nervous. And I see him and we just walk up to each other and give this big old hug. And oh my gosh, the, the emotion I felt, I felt like my heart was beating on my chest (laughs) and I had like happy tears and it was so just absolutely wonderful. It was so wonderful to meet him in the flesh, not just talk to him over the phone or see pictures of him. Like I was holding my dad. I had my dad in my arms after almost 40 years of never, ever knowing. And it was amazing. It was so great. All of it was just wonderful. And we sat there and talked for hours, talked for hours. It was so just amazing. And uh, I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that moment for as long as I live. Well, I, I, I would imagine that people listening to this, if their dad is still around, that dad's going to get an extra hug. <laughs> yes. Hug your, hug your dad tight. Hug your mom tight. Hug everybody. That's if, if I've learned anything in my little 40 years of life is never ever pass the opportunity to tell somebody right now what they mean to you because you truly never know if tragedy is going to strike and your parent will be taken from you or your loved one will be taken from you or you'll never get to meet your biological mother brother sister you know you you never know life is precious uh, that, that's definitely something that I've learned this time around is that life is very precious. Don't take it for granted. Tell people that they you love them and tell them, tell them that they mean something to you. It's important. That was the, the one thing when I finally did, I think we kind of skipped over that part. I actually ended up confronting my, my dad that raised me, my other dad. And that was one thing I made abundantly clear to him is that this changes nothing. At that point in time, I still hadn't known who my biological father was, but I, um, I told him, I was like, this, this change is nothing. You, you raised me, you, you raised me my whole life. You were a wonderful father to me. Even if I found out my dad was in the next town, like you're, you're still my dad too. 
I would like to know my biological family, but you're, you're my father. There's, there's nothing that changes that. And I love you. And I want you to be a part of my life. And if this is too much for you to handle, you know, I understand and I won't like it, but I understand if you'd want to walk away. Um, if you're hurt, you know, if you're hurt by mom's actions, because he, he knew, but he didn't know he had suspicions, but he ultimately didn't really care. He, he loved my mom and he wanted a family. So, you know, he just, he did what he thought was right. I think he was pretty grateful for that. We are, you know, we still talk, we still see each other. And I tell him all the time that I love him. And, um, I, I don't want that to change because even though I, I have my biological father in my life and he's a very present piece of my life right now, even though we're a whole United States away from each other, we talk every day, my biological father and I um, we talk every single day and I love hearing from him. I look forward to hearing from him and I want to be greedy and keep both of my dads. <laughs> you, yeah. You said, Tom, your new, your bio dad has never had a cell phone. No, he's never had a cell phone. He, like, I don't know who makes it around these days without a cell phone, but uh, this guy, he didn't have a cell phone and um, we were laughing about it. And he's like, well, golly, now I got to go get one because I want to be able to, you know, keep up with you. And I want to be able to receive pictures of the grandkids and I want to be able to talk to you whenever I want to talk to you. So uh, he marched himself over to the cell phone store and uh, he is the proud owner of a sweet flip phone. <laughs> oh, it is adorable. And he, he, the messages that he sends are the absolute best. He loves to write. So every text message I get is like a text haiku and it's always signed like, love dad or love the fugitive, <laughs> you know, is a uh, wife has dementia. She's so sweet. She has dementia. He went for a walk one day. She woke up and didn't realize that he had gone and she had thought that he was missing for days and bless her heart. She called the police to go look for him. He wasn't missing. He was just out on his walk. And so now our joke is that he's the fugitive. So, um, He'll sometimes sign off that way too. And it's super adorable. There was a story about your mom <laughs> that can you relate uh, what happened? And that was when you were here in Florida, right? Yeah, that was, that was the day that I met my dad backstory on this one. The, my mother being Southern, if anybody is listening that has a Southern mother, you fully understand this. My mom would like pat me in the back of the head when I wasn't acting right, <laughs> it wasn't a slap or anything like that. She was knocking my head off my shoulders. It was just like a pat on the head, like get it together, like straighten up. I, I got those quite often. And she would also yell at me when I would discipline my daughter, even though it was my daughter, she felt that I had no right to discipline her granddaughter. How dare I? They were just thick as thieves. And the day that I had to bury my mother, it was as you can imagine, it was very stressful. It was very emotionally taxing. My daughter was four. So she was arguing about the type of nylon she was wearing. And these ones were itchy and these ones were not warm enough. And I was just trying to get her dressed so we could go. It was very, very cold out. It was the day before Christmas Eve. So it was very, very cold outside. And I'm trying to make sure that she's warm enough. And of course she's acting crazy and not listening and just making me so irritated because I just had no patience. And so I was constantly yelling at her all day, like correcting her and telling her no. And at the end of the day, I was just spent. I was so tired. I put her to bed, went to go take a bath, leaned over into the tub to turn the water on. And I'm standing there feeling the temperature of the water, waiting for it to get warmer. And just then the shower curtain fell off and popped me right in the back of the head what on earth? And initially I was like, what in the, what in the heck? And then I started laughing. Cause I'm like, oh my gosh, that was my mom. <laughs> that had to be like, if anybody can come back from beyond the grave, it would be this lady to pop me in the back of the head. 100%. And I just had a good laugh about it. I'm like, okay, I get it. I'll leave Ashlyn alone. I understand. I'll calm down. Like I'll settle down. And so 
that was the only time in the past almost 18 years that that has happened. The day that I met my dad, again, we sat outside, we talked for a really long time. It was wonderful. And they had to leave. We all go back inside um, to sit down in the condo. And my boyfriend and I were sitting on the bed and we're just both staring at each other. Like that really just happened. Like, he's like, honey, you know, you met your dad. You, you did it. You met, you found him and you met him. Like, how do you feel? And I was just like, oh my gosh, this is just so amazing. Like, oh man, just then. Like there was this big crash <laughs> and I was like, what in the world is this? I look, the shower curtain in the bathroom had fallen off and had fallen onto the ground. And we just started busting out laughing. Like that was absolutely my mom. Like Robert knew the story of the shower curtain and we just started laughing so hard because we knew like, again, if anybody's going to reach out and truly be known on this is me. There's no question. It's me. It's my mom and her shower curtain. And it was just so funny. I think it was just like her way of saying like, Hey, I saw good job. Good job. figuring it out. (laughs) Well, not, not many people can say, Hey, I have a great shower curtain story, (laughs) but, uh, but you're one of them though. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) In your case, obviously this all turned out happy for everyone. Yes. But yes. that's not always the case. W- would you say people who are wondering about their own family should still try, even though they know the results might not be what they expect or hope for? I I do, and I'm and I'm sure there's, you know, I'm sure there's other people. I've heard lots of other stories. I, you know, I, I read about some before I really started pursuing my own. But I think, I think if you go into it with the mindset of truly, really expecting nothing. And that way you'll be pleasantly surprised either way that even if it's not okay, at least, you know, you have closure, you can start a new chapter of your life. You can close that chapter of your life. You can do whatever you want um, because ultimately you've spent all this time of your life, not knowing anything. So the fact that that one person continues to not want to be in your life shouldn't change the way that you feel. It should just give you peace and just move on just to know, I think would be enough, but I think it's easy for me to say because I had a happy story. So I don't want to sound insensitive to that because I I know that there's so many other heartbreaking stories out there that I am so happy that mine was a good one. As I was talking to Monica, we figured out that Tom is not only here in Florida, but where he lives is not actually that far from me. I visited one afternoon with Tom and his wife Betty just to get his perspective on this whole thing. He told me that from his point of view, it's life-changing. He's 68 years old and never expected to have any children, and he's really happy that Monica was able to figure it out and find him. One question I asked Tom is this, what would you want Monica to know about you as a person? His answer was, I want her to know that I'm honest, I'm loyal, and I'm fair. Those have always been my three guideposts in life. I think Monica and Tom finding each other is a win for both of them. Hey, you heard a couple of ads in this episode. Did you know that you can get every episode ad-free? All you have to do is become a patron of the show for $5 a month. And you get all the bonus exclusive Raw Audio 911 episodes that are only available to supporters. Raw Audio 15 was just released, and this is what you'll hear. A call to 911 when someone witnesses a road rage shooting. Gray Chevy Malibu. You gotta hurry up because it fired shots in that truck and I'm not sure if somebody's hit. A family argument gets violent. 911. I just shot a little son of a bitch in my house. You did what? I just shot somebody. And a young boy is trapped inside a hot car with his drunk mother. Can you roll down a window? Nope. Yeah. Oh no. The windows are locked. Hey, give me give the phone to your mother for me, hun. 
No, she's just going to hang it up. Okay, okay. That's all right. You can sign up to support the podcast at whatwasthatlike.com slash support. If you want to contact me, you can always email me at scott at whatwasthatlike.com or by regular mail at P.O. Box 5, Safety Harbor, Florida, 34695. And here's this week's listener story. I'll see you in two weeks. When I was in my early 20s, I moved back home to my parents' house in my hometown, and I didn't really know anyone there anymore. I didn't really have any connections or have anyone close to me outside of my family. And... I thought it would be a good idea to go down to the local mall and just walk around and see if I could find anyone who looked friendly that I might be able to strike up a relationship with. I did come across someone who, he reminded me a lot of a friend that I'd had in my former town where I'd been living, and I thought maybe I could form a connection with this person. So we talked for a while and exchanged phone numbers. After talking for a couple of weeks, um, he did ask me out on a date. The only problem was that he didn't drive, so I would have to go and pick him up at his house where he lived with his grandmother, and that wasn't too much of a big deal to me because it's not that common, or really not that uncommon, to find people who don't drive in larger cities. So I waited all week, and I was pretty excited, and then when the day came, he pretty much ghosted me. I couldn't get him on the phone, and he wouldn't answer any texts, so I just thought maybe he wasn't as interested as I thought he was, and pretty much let it go, just because, you know, sometimes things don't work out. But then he got a hold of me a couple of days later. He called, and he explained that the reason that he had not gone on that date with me was because he had lost his ferret. His ferret had died, and... He was really very upset by that and didn't feel up to getting out and being social. And I understood that, and I I took it as a reasonable excuse. Because any time I've ever, you know, experienced something like that, it can be kind of traumatizing. So we made arrangements to go out the next following weekend. And when that day came, he did not ghost me. He did answer the phone. I ended up over there at his grandmother's house to pick him up. He didn't quite have everything in order, so I followed him to his bedroom so that he could pick up the last few things that he needed, just to make sure that he was, you know, prepared and had his wallet with him and all of those different things that you do. But when he opened up the bedroom door, the thing that I noticed first was that his bedroom pretty much just consisted of four blank walls, a bare full-size mattress in the middle of the floor. There was no sheet or blankets or anything like that. And probably there had to have been 200 empty soda cans just piled all around the bed, like in little towers and stacks. But that wasn't, that wasn't the main thing that I noticed. The main thing that I noticed was that suddenly my eyes were burning and they started to water. And then the smell hit my nose and it coated like the inside of my nose in a way that makes sure that you'll never forget the intensity of the stench that it will be burned into you, into your memory. And he said, oh, don't mind that. That's just my ferret. And I looked, and over in the corner, there was indeed a ferret cage with a dead ferret in it. And obviously, I was completely shocked that he had been coexisting with the corpse of his dead pet ferret as it sat in the corner of his room probably for over a week at this point. He was really disappointed that we didn't get to go on that date, but I wasn't very disappointed when I went home. That was enough of a red flag for me.